And uh, today I'm going to call, talk about C++ on the web, calling it for developers without foreign users, a uh, catchy title that doesn't really mean much. Um, so basically I'm just going to a quick overview. Uh, so I work mostly on portable native client. Uh, portable native client is you know, portable, fast, secure. The goal is to kind of just run anything inside the browser. Uh, so it's kind of a little micro OS with Linux like syscall, right? So it has its own syscall, so it works on, on, on Windows and Mac and Linux. And uh, the bit code that ships to be portable, right, to be cross ISA, is based partly on LVM. So I get to talk about something like that uh, last year on the conference. So the goal for it is to be stable, right? So it can target x 63 64 uh, ARM and NIPS. And then it supports you know, full normal concurrency and parallelism, so you can use key threads or you can use C11 uh, comics and threads, as well as um, Futex. Futex is like kind of the base syscall that makes the rest of the uh, text work. Um, and then you can do a bunch of other stuff. You can use GLES uh, and, uh, to you know, display uh, things on the screen. Uh, you can use C proteins and, and things like that. Uh, so that's kind of the, the basic idea of, of what Pinnacle is and what it does. And uh, fairly soon we'll have GLES 3, which is kind of coming on coming online all the browsers at the same time. It makes compilation harder, it makes uh, smaller updates more difficult, and you can't kind of progressively start up an app as you download it. Uh, we're also working on uh, supporting glibc inside of the LPM. Uh, so traditionally glibc is pretty much only worked with GCC. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of programs rely on GLC's kind of specific behaviors and stuff like that. So if you're willing to use the LGPL, it's another thing that you know, will allow you to do. And obviously, that goes really well with magnetic linking. Um, and then we're also working on better socket support. Right now, we have some amount of socket support. Now, obviously, because we run on the web, uh, socket support is kind of restricted to the web security model, which I'll talk a bit more about uh, later. And then we're also kind of working on supporting more languages. Uh, we don't just want to support uh, C++. It's just easy to support C++ when you have LVM. But other languages like, say, you know, uh, Rust or Go or Julia or even uh, uh, MSIL could be supported with that. There's just some amount of ground work involved in doing that. Uh, we do have kind of external contributors. Someone recently got Rust running kind of fully end to end, and there are some patches that needs to push into LVM and stuff like that to make it work. But mostly, it's you know kind of interesting. Uh, so, kind of a, a, a quick demo of what we've been able to do for quite a while now. Uh, this is the game of life, just written in C using CMD, and you know you can just kind of touch it and stuff like that. It's pretty and it works. Right? So it's kind of simple. Straightforward. Uh, you can do a bit more complicated stuff, like say physics simulations, right? So if you've ever heard of folding at home, it does uh, protein folding to simulate um, you know, folding proteins to do medical research. And if they have a patient that uses pills, you can donate time to of your CPU to enhance medical research. And so that's kind of a silly example of flocking uh, written in C++. Yeah. All right. So that quick intro. Um, you know, that's kind of the basics of what we've been able to do for a while. Uh, we have kind of more interesting stuff that we can do nowadays. Uh, now, a word of warning. What I'm going to show you now is um, not, I wouldn't say experimental, but there's some smoke and mirrors to show you what we think will be there in a few, in a few weeks. Uh, until then, it'll work on my laptop. It may not work on yours. Right, so I'm using, I'm using Chrome Beta right now. Um, so you know, there, there's a few tricks that I pull and stuff. If you go to the GitHub page for, for this repo, you, you can kind of see the little tricks I pull. But most of it is there and working, right? Um, so <clears throat> what I just did is I pushed a button and I started uh, Bash inside of my browser. Um, right, so this is actually Bash, like all of it, running inside of the browser. Right, so that's kind of cool. Uh, obviously. I have a whole file system running in there. Um, I can do you know simple stuff like a cat or something like that, and uh, obviously you know do some, yeah simple things that you'd expect to work. I can uh, touch the file and then some files there, and it has a modification time and stuff like that. So um, and the files physically are located where? I'll get to that later, the okay. location of the box. Um, 
And uh, you can do kind of more complicated things. Right? So you can just kind of pop Python open uh, if you wanted to, and then you know, kind of run a Fibonacci sequence or something like that. Obviously, you can also hose yourself and do something like this, and then you can just control C and it works, right? So, uh, <coughs> type of things that you'd expect to work kind of just do work, right? And so, even in Python, I can go and uh, port date time and then ask it what the current time is. Uh, do it. Great typo, and it gives me the date and time. Now, just, just to point out, these are separate processes running inside the browser, doing pretty complicated things like asking the OS what the current time is and things like that. Um, so there's kind of fun stuff you can do. Um, and then the basic idea that, that, of this is the pinnacle demos I showed you earlier with the game of life and the flocking uh, examples uh, basically are just kind of a single process, right? So what you do, uh, in, in your, 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 your web page is you just put an embed tag and the embed tag just kind of loads the pro, the, 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 the taxi so the portable executable translates it into something your architecture actually can run so XC6 code or ARM code or something like that uh, and then executes it. Um, so to be able to support multiple processes what we end up doing in, uh, in the demo that I have here is it will sound ludicrous but uh, JavaScript is our microkernel. Okay, so uh, we're using <laughs> We're using JavaScript as a little microkernel to spawn processes um, and have them talk to each other, right? So the, basically, Chrome has a pretty solid security model. When you spawn a process, it started with very low capabilities. And so uh, you have to kind of, from that process, talk to JavaScript, like if you want to have a pipe, say SDDN or CDI or something like that. Uh, that's your pipe, and then JavaScript kind of ties that together, shoots it off to the other process. So that's, it's kind of intuitive when you think about it, it's kind of ludicrous at the same time. Uh, and so, if I look here, I have this little program called JSA eval, and uh, I can like tell it to execute stuff, I can like alert uh, one plus one, and obviously that will pop up a window that says two here. Right? So I can talk to JavaScript, and once you can talk to JavaScript, you can do anything. Um, Alright, so that, that's, kind of, that's kind of cute, right? it's kind of fun. And uh, you were asking where, where the files live, right? So I can, uh, there's, that's a little explorer here that I have. And um, basically, um, this allows you to uh, you know, kind of browse the content of, of things, right? So uh, as I open this here, uh, the, the file system is, that's exposed is the HTML5 file system. So it's part of the web platform that Chrome ships. It's not actually standard, unfortunately. So we need kind of a better replacement, but it's been in Chrome forever and it's re realistically not gonna go away. Uh, but web browsers also support databases and other stuff that are not quite sufficient to do kind of real fast file IO like you're, you're used to. Um, but uh, you can support other file systems also. Right, so uh, I think this week someone from my team just checked in support for um, kind of remote file systems. So you could kind of just so in your code you literally just mount like like you know POSIX type syscalls uh, a file system, and uh, then you can just use it. Right. So you can currently mount I think the uh, uh, Google Drive API. So you kind of you know, mount your Google Drive thing, and you have to use the usual kind of API keys and stuff like that, and then you have full access to Google Drive. Right. And that's kind of cool. Uh, you can you know, kind of sync things in the background and other stuff. And obviously, the same APIs can be used to support, say, Dropbox or whatever else you want to support. Right? So you can do kind of cute little things out of that. Um, so it's kind of like the, the basic idea that we have here. Um, now, you, you can do other kind of interesting things. Uh, for example, you could kind of go here and decide to run Git. And I'll probably do a typo here. Okay, so I'll clone the GitHub repo that I have, and that's it. Uh, so just remember, like that folder didn't exist before, 
And now it does, right? So I have like a paper that I wrote recently for the C++ Times Committee, and it's here, right? I encourage you highly to go read this paper, it's very entertaining. Uh, but other than that, uh, like I just own the GitHub repo from inside my browser, which is kind of cool. Um, now, you, you, okay, so I ran Git and stuff like that. Git forces a bunch of processes and opens a socket. Uh, we'll get back to sockets later, it's a bit tricky. Um, but uh, that, that's kind of, okay, that, that's nice. Like, we're at an LVM conference though, so you know, maybe I should do something related to LVM. Um, so, I have this little demo here uh, with uh, C++ files and a big file. Um, so, we're going to go and play with that a bit. Um, so, first of all, we'll, we'll just look at the make file a bit with Vim, because obviously Vim also works in there. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a standard make file. It has some hacks for my little setup, uh, but in, in, in the most, it's, it's, it's pretty much a regular make file. Uh, and so, uh, we'll just kind of make sj4 or whatever, because I have four cores on this amazing Chromebook. By the way, Chromebook Pixel 2, quite awesome, I'm sure I'll get one. Uh, but yeah, so right now I'm, I'm running make and uh, LVM inside my browser, uh, compiling C++ files, and generating portable executables, right? So, so remember, all of these are executables that run inside the browser, and I took C files and generated another portable executable inside the browser. Right, so if I go here and I look at it, I now have uh, fire.pexy and hello.pexy inside uh, the folder. And so I can just kind of run hello world. Right? It seems kind of stupid, but it's actually really complicated. <laughs> um, and uh, there's also this kind of nice make fire uh, thing that we have. So the, the fire demo is a, a kind of demo of, of WebGL. And what I did is I obviously just compiled it, and then you can kind of pop it in a separate window. Uh, so this you know, just told JavaScript pop a new window and create some fire. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not super exciting, but you can create fire. So that's cool. Um, so in general, that's kind of the, the high level idea. Um, now you can you can you know kind of uh, do other stuff like uh, go here and create another directory, um, Emacs or something. Um, Obviously, you know, Emacs also works, but it looks way slower than Vim does. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't laugh. I'm an Emacs user. <laughs> well, come on. You never close Emacs. <laughs> why would you? Yeah, why would you? Like, come on. So, okay. is the browser running inside the Emacs? <laughs> <laughs> I, I expected a lot of questions. That one was not one I expected. <laughs> but soon, patch is welcome. <laughs> okay, so we'll do that, and then we'll do something like uh, means for T. So you're, you're all looking at this now, and you're like, oh, I see exactly what, what's going to happen. So I'll, I'll just uh, throw a little uh, intervention there. Um, also, I can't tell. Okay, so hopefully I don't have any typos here. You have to do the third and fib.
And I'm like, we're going to open next again. <laughs> I just need a drink. <laughs> now you'll notice what's awesome with this is you even have LLVM mode working inside of Vmax. Like, come on. Right? So this is, this is properly highlighted bit code. Isn't that fun? Okay? And so, yeah, and, and you can see that you know, it actually optimized uh, Fibonacci here. Right? So that's as expected. It's very useful. Um, and then, so, so, so now we're going to do something a bit weird. Okay, so I'm going to go here. So we can do this. Um, yeah, so fib.ll, and then we're going to put fib.ll. That should be four. Okay, so it's not happy about the, 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 the triple, but I, I don't really care about that. <coughs> so, um, right, so what I just did is I, I took the, the L file and I generated JavaScript code. Right, so that's kind of fun. So you can remember, Initially, this was C++ code, and basically, uh, the client that I had running uh, has Inscriptin built in it. So, built, running inside of Pinnacle, I have Inscriptin, and I use that to, to generate <laughs> JavaScript code. Now, the, 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 the tricky bit here is that this, this isn't actually JavaScript code quite. Like, oh, like, oh, oh, instead of VM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not actually. <laughs> Sorry, All right, so let's uh, move the. Oh, no, that's not what I want. Oh, that's what I did. Nice. There we go. If I open the JavaScript file, I get the JavaScript code, obviously. Um, so it's not quite JavaScript code, but it's, it's, it's mostly JavaScript code. And Scripten likes to kind of come in with a Python script and massage things into. To, into a uh, proper uh, JavaScript layer. But uh, th this is you know, actually in, in the, 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 the current uh, Canary SDK of, of portable layer clients. So if you go and download it today, you can kind of do what I just did, and it's very exciting. Um, so obviously, the, the next step is I take this, and I you know, put a slap a main onto it, and then I kind of run it inside the browser, but outside of Pinnacle, because I work on Chrome. It's this type of thing I do all day long. I just, I just run JavaScript. Um, so so that, that's kind of fun, right? So <clears throat> the other thing that's fun is, is, okay, obviously, like, this entire thing is a web page, right? So I have, like, kind of pretty animations and stuff like that if I go around. Um, but I'm also serving this from a Python server that's itself running inside of native client, right? So I, remember, <laughs> remember I, I'm, a, I'm a Chromebook, right? And you guys like to laugh about Chromebooks? The, this Chromebook is running Python and serving a thing to local host which is kind of awesome, right? I, I find it's awesome. So anyways, and, and you know, Python, because it uses sockets, can't run inside the browser usually. Uh, so you have to run it as an app. So yeah, you can install an app and run it. And that's fun. So uh, that's cool. Uh, so I just ran a bunch of processes and did a bunch of stuff. And now you're like, OK, well, this is a talk about security, right? So there's a bunch of, of things you want to do uh, when you do that. And just one question about this presentation. Yes. Are you watching too much of Inception? <laughs> <laughs> it, Inception is a good movie, yes. Because like we're like in a browser that runs a server that's in a browser and you run a like, code into it that will Yes. <laughs> yes. And still it doesn't run any Max. It, and still it doesn't run in Max yet. Right? Remember how they go into fourth level? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, so, so uh, now, now that I did all these cool things, and it, it's, it, yeah, it's fine and everything, uh, now you're all like, oh shit, if I run Chrome, you're just going to run any kind of, kind of random malware in my process. It's not quite how it works, right? So we're actually kind of paranoid about security. Um, so what we did back in 2008 was we created NACL, and the idea of NACL is we do software fault isolation. So we ensure that every branch goes to a known safe location and can't go outside of its sandbox, right? And then that runs inside a process that has all the untrusted code basically unable to escape, unable to do writes and reads in, in dangerous places. And uh, there's a little, you know, kind of trampoline for the OS calls that goes to trusted code that can then, then talk to Chrome or whatever embedding framework you're doing, because you can use it outside of Chrome also. So that's the basic idea. And then there's a process sandbox around it. 
So if you're running inside of Chrome on Linux, you're using SecCom DPF, which does kind of uh, um, syscall filtering and other stuff like that. And if you're running inside of, of uh, OS X or inside of, of Windows, you have different process level sandboxes. Right? So we're kind of already pretty paranoid. We have two levels of sandboxes here. And then uh, Portable Native Client uh, uses NACL as an implementation detail. Right? So the idea is the user can't really see that he's running inside of a NACL sandbox. Uh, but Pinnacle does use NACL in a restricted sense. Right? So the idea is you, you take this portable executable, translate it to a, a native executable that follows the NACL sandboxing rules. And um, the, the, the idea there is that you know, we can change the sandbox as much as we want. Right? So we actually don't use the original sandbox in 2008. We use kind of slightly different things. Uh, we'll talk about some of that a bit later. Um, now what's interesting is, is, okay, so you download the PEXI, the portable executable, right, so Emacs or whatever, and then you translate it to a native executable. So there are two attack surfaces here, right? Uh, the, the, the translator itself, right, so what, what takes the PEXI, generates an EXE, could be exploited, and then uh, the next that you generate could be exploited, right? So, so the attacker is, is trying to attack us from both sides, right? So what we do is we actually, when we run LVM inside of the browser, we run it in a sandbox. Right, so back to inception here. Um, so the idea is you can try to own LLVM or the small part of LLVM that we actually run. Right? So we actually only run the back end, uh, but it's still inside a sandbox. Right? So you can also try to get it to generate, uh, um, to generate malicious code. And I'll talk about some of the kind of workarounds that we have for that. And even if you manage to do either of these, you still have to escape the software fault isolation and the OS sandboxes. Right? So we're nesting deeper and deeper into the, the the security uh, that we have. Now, now I'm telling you people here, you're mostly developers, and you're like, I don't really care. Now, we have like maybe, you know, a few hundred or thousands of developers, uh, we have like over a billion users, right? So to, to a certain approximation, we kind of have to protect the users really well. Um, so, so this is actually really important, right? Like, like we can't ship a product inside of Chrome that would, you know, cause basically a billion people to get home. Uh, it actually really matters, right? Um, so, one of the things that we do is, uh, we, we, we've been you know, talking that, I don't know if you guys saw the patches in the LVM mailing list, uh, there, there's kind of some work that's been going on for randomization, and that's actually really, really cool. Because what this does is, uh, the translator generates code, but it makes the attacker unable to know what's going to get generated. Right, so the biggest class of attack that there is nowadays uh, would be return-oriented programming. Right? So the idea of return-oriented programming is, okay, there, there's, a, there's a, a no execute bit, so I can't just execute data as if it's code, and there's no JIT, so I can't just generate code and execute my exploit. So what I'll do instead with return-oriented programming is I'll cobble together the exploit, right? so kind of the basic blocks of what I would need to, to execute malicious code, from the code that already exists, right? So a, pr a pretty frequent attack on, on Chrome or Firefox or something like that is you take the rendering engine, which is ginormous, and uh, you just kind of look through the code. So you actually you know, manage to escape kind of one layer of security. You start looking through the code, and you find exactly the exploit you want in that code, and you chain it together, right? So you chain them, and you just kind of jump from one part of the code to the other in a way that was never really meant to be used. Now, the way we want to fix this in portable native client, and it's something that's ongoing right now, is uh, we want to use randomization. So the idea is the attacker is giving us code, right? So not only if you give us a, a PEXI, you know exactly what code we're going to generate. Except if we start randomizing it, you don't, right? Now the problem with that is, okay, you don't know what code got generated, but you can read the, 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 the code itself. So it doesn't really matter, right? You just generate a bunch of code, and then you read through it, you find the exploit you wanted. It's just a bit harder. Right, so we also want to uh, pair that with code hiding. Right, so there, there's kind of interesting ways to make it completely impossible from C and C++ code to actually know where the code is. And so that's kind of standard in most kind of virtual machines like you know Python or, or JavaScript or something like that. You can't you know in JavaScript if you read you can't read the pointer of an object. Right, whereas in in, in C and C++ you could. Right, so those kind of mesh really well together to prevent the biggest type of attack that there is nowadays. Right? So rock attacks are really, really huge. Now what's great about randomization is all of that work can be done upstream. Right? So we can randomize instruction selection or register allocation and stuff like that. And 
it's not clear right now what the right mix of randomization is and in which context you want to use one or the other. Right? So the, the way the framework is currently set up, well, right now it, it does random knob insertion, which is slightly useful, but not really. Uh, and the other stuff is still kind of being discussed at uh, for upstreaming. But the idea is for different types of applications, you may want different types of randomization. Right? So what's cool is you kind of have the knobs in there and the, the passes to just kind of tune the randomization. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and then we have another kind of interesting thing uh, that we've been doing. Uh, we started doing fuzzing a lot on LLVM itself, right? So uh, the, the, the fuzzing that we started doing is the kind of obvious silly fuzzing uh, of doing random bit flips. Now, one thing that's really different from most users of LLVM is we don't actually care about the front end, right? Like Clang, Clang is usually what gets fuzzed because it's a pain in the ass as a developer when Clang just crashes. Uh, for us, it's not an attack surface. We're not, we're not using fuzzing to increase the reliability of stuff that the developers see. We're actually trying to you know, secure it. Right? So we want bit code generation, bit code reading, and stuff like that to actually be secure. So uh, we did random bit flips. We ran it on cluster fuzz, which is Chrome's kind of fuzzing infrastructure. And the problem with that is that the, the, the bit code format that we support is, is non vital line. And so if you flip one bit, just one bit, like everything after it is completely different. Right, it can be completely meaningless. And so that actually still found some bugs right, inside of, of our code base and LVM code base, code, code base as well. It found about six bugs, I think, or seven. So it's, and it, after a while, we are like, OK, it's not finding anything else, so we just stopped it. Right? So we'll probably run it again, but it's, it hasn't really been that useful in our experience. Um, so what we started doing instead is, is writing a fuzzer that's format aware. It's aware of the first the uh, encoding of the bit code format. So I'm not, talk I'm not thinking about the SSA values right now, I'm thinking about abbreviations and records. Right? So that's like one part of the code base that nobody actually looks at. But uh, so we started doing that, and then we're going to do uh, um, rent, uh, kind of format aware fuzzing of bit code itself, which is generally useful for the rest of LVM. Right? And that, what that allows you to do is it also allows you to fuzz the rest of the, 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 rest of the, the code that gets generated. Right? So not, not just fuzzing from C++ onwards, but fuzzing from bit code itself. Right? So you can then kind of run it through random passes and see what happens. Uh, the problem with that is, is uh, so far, we haven't been able to make any forward progress because of the discussion that was had earlier today, uh, memory leaks. Right? So AFL is kind of an interesting fuzzing uh, uh, framework, but um, libfuzzer that was checked in recently until LVM is, is way faster. And the problem is it runs in process, just like starts your function, tries to see if there's a crash, and starts it again. And uh, it just kind of long jumps back to the original code. And the problem is if you leak memory, that can't really go on for very long. Right? Okay. So, so we, we've been trying to fix some of the memory leaks inside of LVM. And what's great is, is as soon as you like, cause an error in the bit code reader, it starts leaking memory. Right? So the, the, the main path of the bit code reader doesn't actually leak memory. But the, the, the error path is just like leaky. And the problem is there's all these weird abstractions and stuff like that. So it's kind of a huge pain in the ass, and we have to kind of try to fix it. Right? So that's been kind of going on kind of slowly. Um, and then, I don't think I have slides for that, but we've also been, uh, there's Peter Collinborn in, in the Chrome team has uh, added recently kind of a, another control isolation uh, past LVM. But what's interesting there, is instead of doing control flow isolation in kind of a very general way, the same way NACL does, it, it's based on, on uh, virtual tables and uh, on uh, non-virtual calls, right? So it kind of checks that every call is to a location that makes sense, especially for, for V tables. And so what it does is it has kind of a side data structure in your executable uh, that tells you whether a, a V table is in your data structure or not, right? So it's, it's pretty cool. And it can also be used to do de-virtualization kind of the inverse of what it was built to do. Right, so that, that kind of came in pretty recently, and it's, at, yeah, it's actually a pretty cool code base. Right now, it, it kind of loads the executable a bit by, I think, 12 or 15% on Chrome, but it's getting kind of better. Right? And so the idea is you can like run all of Chrome, and all the virtual table calls are checked. So that's actually kind of cool, and it allows us to run the same thing inside of LVM itself. Right? So we compile LVM with that, and it allows us to not just check that um, jumps go to known locations, but they go to known locations that actually make sense, right? So you can't jump to the wrong V table, even though you know, uh, we already have some checks. That's kind of a nice other layer. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the, the kind of uh, list of stuff that we've been working on 
recently for, for, uh, for hardening. Um, and then there's also things like you know, ILP32 support that came on, online recently, and that's you know, kind of cool code. So it allows you to you know, run 32-bit uh, pointers inside a 64-bit sandbox. For x 64 it's actually really useful. And for most users of the web, at least, like if you're using more than four gigs of memory, it's not like, super cool to do that. So uh, for us, it's not really an issue that our code is 32 bits. It may be one day, right, if we want to run really, really big games or something like that, but for now, it's not really. So we haven't really taken care of supporting 64-bit stuff. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a general overview of the security stuff we're doing. And uh, please come and try to hack us. Uh, so uh, Native Client is, is, is covered under the Chrome Vulnerability Report Program. And so we actually pay researchers to try to really successfully hack into our code base. Uh, unfortunately, it's only ever happened once on a released product that, that there was yeah, the, the, the actual security patch, that was like a month ago for Rowhammer. So if you're not aware of Rowhammer, there's a researcher on our team who found a vulnerability in RAM, so in actual hardware, uh, where you could use things like sail flush to cause leakage of memory. So not memory leaks, but the, you know, the voltage kind of started leaking between different rows, and that allowed you to do fun things like you know, change the, the page tables inside the kernel. Um, so we patched NACL to prevent CL flush usage, and that's the only vulnerability we've ever known of in NACL in the, since 2008. Um, so that's kind of unfortunate. But uh, we'd like to improve security a bit more, and, and that involves often finding bugs we're not aware of. Right? So please, please do try to hack us. It's fun. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the other thing is, I'll kind of throw another monkey wrench in there. Uh, so I, I showcased some JavaScript stuff, and it kind of didn't really make sense in the rest of the presentation, except uh, it's inside our SDK, right? So the idea is, okay, well, we have portable native client that runs inside of Chrome, but it doesn't run inside of other browsers, and it'd be great if it did, right? So uh, what we've been doing recently is, okay, so the, the SDK can emit JavaScript code, but JavaScript is a single-threaded model, right? So that's kind of a problem, because basically everything uses threads, and then JavaScript, uh, JavaScript is non-blocking, so you can't just be in a loop. Right, so you have to kind of stop blocking just any point in your C++ code. Uh, so we've been working for a while, um, for about a year, on, on supporting something like shared memory inside of, of JavaScript. It's not clear how it would integrate inside the language itself, right? But uh, other browsers really, really want to target JavaScript. That's cool. Uh, we, we'd like to kind of all be on the same page. And really supporting C++ code in JavaScript involves supporting uh, shared memory. So you know, there, there's kind of a, a paper that's been proposed to do that. Uh, it supports, you know, kind of the same thing we do, uh, the C++ 11 memory model, or right now it's just sequential consistency that's, that supports, uh, as well as few text. Uh, so that'd be kind of interesting. Uh, and then, you know, JavaScript is getting better, actually. It's, as a language, it's kind of fun to use, except when it's not. Uh, but it's also going to support SIMD at some point, and I don't know how it's going to support processes, right? So what I showed you earlier about doing control C uh, on a process that's running, or just running multiple processes at the same time and not running out of address space, or one process crashing and not crashing the other one, I don't know how that's going to work, but that'd be pretty cool to have. And then the whole security thing that I talked about, uh, I have no clue right now, right? But it'd be great if you were able to run C++ code in just any browser and it just kind of worked, right? And also did so securely. So, with that, uh, it's pretty much the end of my presentation, uh, I guess. And uh, yeah, so I'll take any questions you have. So, uh, we have five minutes, so we can have some questions. Hi, um, sockets. Did you explain how oh. sockets work? Yeah, I forgot to say that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the, the, everything that I showed is basically, you know, running inside the browser can't break the web security model, right? So a regular web page can't just pop a socket open. There's this thing called web sockets that allows you to have very restricted sockets. Uh, Git pull is not one of those restricted types of sockets that I just used. So what I actually did here is I cheated and I told Chrome to let me open sockets from local host. Really, the, the way that, that the web is evolving is kind of a capabilities-based thing, right? So you can ask the user to be able to do something, or you can have an extension that exposes a new capability, 
right? And uh, like most users won't want to use git pull inside their browser, right? So it doesn't really make sense for Chrome to support that by default. Um, but uh, what makes sense is having extensions extend that and having the developer basically say, hey, I'm a developer, so I want to be able to pull just random git repos. And it's kind of the same thing with debugging. Uh, so we, we had a, if you go to Google I.O. 2014, we had kind of a little video that showcases how to use GDB inside the browser. And the idea here is, is you actually just install an extension because you don't want any web page to attach to any other process, right? So like, you know, <laughs> JoeRandomHacker.com looks at BankofAmerica.com and is like, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, you, know, you don't want that to happen. So what, what we do instead is we have you install an extension that allows you to just pop GDB open and attach to another process, right? So once you do that, you've kind of voided your warranty already. If you want to hack yourself, go for it. But uh, it's, not, it's not really useful. Right, so, so that's the type of, of extensions that we're adding slowly. Uh, and I don't think it's hard to write the extensions to support sockets to connect to GitHub. I just, I, I was lazy, so I haven't done it. It's, it's just easy to tell Chrome to let me do it for now, so whatever. So, okay, thanks. Oh, there, you. Okay. Can I run a Windows app that does graphics? So, um, So you can do, um, what is it? Yeah. You can <laughs> XML. Is it XML? Mm. Just XML. a couple of mm. I, I guess I didn't install it. So you, you can start X and you can run X size. Uh, I don't have it installed right now. But yes. Can you bootstrap? So, hmm? Can you bootstrap? Can you build Chrome inside of that and open Chrome? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the problem with running Chrome is that the V8 JavaScript engine is a JIT. Uh, we don't necessarily, we don't usually allow JITs to run inside of a native client process because, okay, it's possible to make a JIT that follows the sandboxing rules. Uh, we've done it before with, with V8. Uh, it, it's hard to maintain afterwards, right? And uh, it's kind of a pain in the ass. So right now it's possible to run V8 inside an ACL through a uh, wonderful magic of using an using the ARM JIT to interpret ARM as your bytecode, and then you run crankshaft uh, on top of that. Um, so back, back to inception again. You, you can, like, on x86, you JIT ARM code, you interpret it, and you run crankshafts, you do type specialization and kind of gearing of the, the, the JIT. That, it's kind of a horrible solution. It's not great. It works, right? But um, it's something that we want to fix later. Right, so, so one of the big things that you can't do right now in sandboxes like these is just have JIT code, right? Uh, it's possible to fix, it's just not the top priority right now. And there's kind of a okay workaround until then. Okay, so last question? We have only two minutes. Okay. If, um, so uh, from the uh, earlier question, it sort of uh, implies that uh, this stuff has some sort of B-trace support built in. That you can sort of read and write memory from another uh, NACL process, right? That's only from an extension that you can read and might write memory to another process. Right. So you can do V-fork, right? But that doesn't like give you P-trace support. You can do V-fork running uh, uh, NACL on Windows? Yes. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> so, so remember, you're not actually forking the real process. You're forking the the um, you're forking the untrusted part of the process. Mm. Right. So, so when you do vfork, you're you're not forking everything. Yeah, it's not real vfork. Yeah. So, vfork. yes. Yeah. So, so it's the same thing as like when you open a pipe. It's not actually opening the pipe. And when you do a few text on with on Windows, it's not actually using a few text because you know it's not how you do it. Uh, but it, it's basically the basic OS emulation is built to support something like POSIX, and and sometimes we have to do a, a bit of leg, leg work to make it work well on Windows. Uh, but most of the time, it actually works quite fine. And and if any of you are wondering where we weren't exposed to the few text bug that someone from our security team found also, uh, so because we don't expose full Linux few text, so the, the sorry Pinkie Pie found that bug, uh, and we were not exposed to that. Okay, okay. Uh, we have to go to the next session. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.